Get going. Well, <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to get together. And thank you for this opportunity of, of a place where we can gather freely. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for the message that we heard this morning. Um, Lord, would you help us to, to look honestly at what we believe about salvation and whether we receive it through Christ alone or whether we believe that we have to add something to it. Lord, this is a, it's a challenging thing. I found it challenging as I studied it. So I, I would just ask that you give us all ears to hear, eyes to see, and, and soften our hearts to be willing to uh, change what might need to be changed. Lord, we are grateful for your Holy Spirit that will guide us in these things. So, um, yeah, just feeling grateful this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. So, I think I know if, every, if anybody doesn't know me, I'm Mark Shaw. Um, my wife, Cindy, and I have been going to church here for about four years. Um, I'm really glad to be here teaching this morning. We've been going through the five solas. Um, Tim started us off with scripture alone. Uh, Cole taught last week through grace alone, that salvation is received through grace alone. Uh, and next week, Luke Fullington will be here, and he will. he missed a week because of the ice, so he will do faith alone and for the glory of God alone, both next week. So um, definitely would encourage you to come for that. But today we are going to be talking about Christ alone, solus Christus. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint today, but we'll be using the whiteboard. You might have looked ahead on the handout and seen that I have biblical algebra on there. So I um, hope nobody's, I hope two things. I hope nobody leaves just because of that. And uh, I also hope that the math teachers in the room aren't too hard on me because I know Lance, just go easy on me. It's, it's metaphorical, biblical algebra, so, okay. So I wanna start off by just asking, what do you think about when you think of Christ alone? What, what comes to mind with, what do you think that means? John 14, six. Did you read my notes? No. no. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, I have it right here. There. Yeah. That uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you're thinking of it like that it's exclusively through Jesus, through, through no one else. Through no one else. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's true. That's, um, we talked about I think when Tim was teaching, we talked about the difference between only or alone, and whether it's Christ only or Christ alone. And I think that that falls into the only category, that it's only through Jesus. It's not Allah, it's not Buddha, it's not um, the saints, it's not through Mary. Um, so there's, there's that part. Uh, another thing that might be only is uh, that it's, it's not through the law. Righteousness cannot be found through the law. Um, you cannot find salvation by being a good person. Galatians 2.21 says, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. It's not by being born in the right place. Um, I, I was... And I'm not talking about just the place where I was born, where that's what I was taught, but there are biblical examples of that. Um, Nicodemus believed that he was born in the right place. We get the idea in churches sometimes, I think, that children born to church-going families, to godly believers, automatically will have salvation inherited, and that's, that's not the case. It, it is through Christ only. Um, so I think that um, what was meant by 
Christ alone when the reformers were putting together these ideas of the solas was they were more talking about the idea that nothing needed to be added to Christ. Nothing needed to be added to the work and person of Jesus for salvation. So it, it absolutely is exclusive. Like he's, Jesus makes that claim uh, in John 14. Uh, but what they're really talking about is they were trying to reform the, the Catholic Church at the time who were saying that it is, that salvation is found through Jesus plus the sacraments, Jesus plus your good works. Um, and, and that's really what they were working against with these five solas and trying to make the case for. Does that make sense? You see the difference between... They already agreed on the only. They already agreed on the only. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. They already agreed on the only, and then they wanted to add some things. Because, and and I, I want us to, I want us to really challenge ourselves with this because it wasn't just the Catholic Church that did this. Paul, remember the letter to the Galatians that Paul wrote? Uh, Tim read from it this morning. Um, the, the Galatians were, in the King James, Paul says that you were bewitched. That, and it was because they believed that they needed to add something to the gospel. And so this is when, uh, just bear with me on the biblical algebra, but it's just a... It's just an idea. So it starts with, it starts with Jesus equals salvation. Did anybody else love algebra as a kid? Oh, yes. Okay, a few. Good. Thank you for raising your hand. I thought I was the only one. But I remember as a kid asking about seeing X in a math problem for the first time. And I remember I asked the teacher so many questions that the teacher finally just said, Mark, X can mean anything. And I was like, well, that, that doesn't work. How can X mean anything? Like this doesn't, it just didn't make sense to me, but I love learning about algebra. So I thought it might be helpful here. So if we take, if we take Jesus plus X. So if we start with Jesus, like, we, like you said, that they were all in agreement that it's exclusively through Jesus. But if we add, what, what could we add here in X? What, what could we put here? Like works could be that. Love. Love. Okay. Yeah. 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 So if you're... What I'm saying here and what the, the reformers meant and what Paul's writing in Galatia is Jesus plus anything equals zero. It, it's, you've heard of addition by subtraction. This is subtraction by addition. If, if you try to add anything to the person and work of Jesus, you lose salvation. You lose the gospel. Now, what if we do it another one? It's kind of the same. This is where I want you to bear with me, Lance. X, if we start with ourselves, if we start with what we might add, no, not what we might add, if we start with our life and we just try to add Jesus, what does that equal? Zero. Zero. Yeah, it's the same, right? You see where I'm going with this? So I, I, thought of, I thought of one that might stump me a little bit. And it was sin. Have you heard the, the saying? I think it was, I can't remember who it was. But someone said that the only thing that I brought to the equation for my salvation was the sin that made it necessary to begin with. So what if we start with, what if we have Jesus... This pen is terrible. Jesus plus our sin equals 
What's that? Salvation. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it is. Now, I figured out how to do that in biblical algebra by saying sin is a negative, so they cross themselves out, and now we're left with Jesus equals salvation. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about that? Any thought? Does that make sense? Is it getting the point across? Okay. All right. So I guess the challenge that I faced was the Galatians did this. The Catholic Church did this at this time. Do we do this? Are there things in your life that you feel like you need to add or that you need to be able to uh, get credit for in addition to the work of Jesus? I'm seeing some nods. It's, it's, um, Subconsciously, we all do that. Yeah. God found it necessary to put it in the Bible to teach us that it's only through him that we get salvation because we do tend to forget yeah. that it's not just... You know, us. Yeah, yeah. We wouldn't be studying the five right. solas if, yeah. if we all knew that already. Yeah, Paul wouldn't have had to write the letter to the Galatians. Yeah, yeah Tom. I think sometimes it's not just addition. Sometimes I, I feel like we need, we feel we need to subtract, um, subtract things that we do. Right. That would make us better, right. That would make us worthy. Right. But Jesus does that. Right. The gospel does that. The work of Jesus on the cross leaves no sin left for us to have to subtract. And plus, how would you subtract it? Like, how, how would we atone for it in any other way than the blood of Jesus? Yeah. Sometimes when I, I think of Eric, Eric, Pastor Eric will use the phrase, uh, making Jesus look good through us. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not a bad phrase, but sometimes we think uh, Jesus looks good if we look good. Right. So, Right. Yeah, that's good. Sometimes it gets confusing if you try to be obedient. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you're adding. Yeah. Or you think yeah. that you need to do this and this and this. Yeah. To out of obedience, so that gets confusing. Right. If you're thinking that your or obedience, obedience comes before your salvation or that your salvation is a result of your obedience, that's backwards. But if we realize that because of the gospel that through our salvation comes our obedience. It, it's, I don't want to say it's a timing thing. It's a, it's a perspective thing. We, we need to realize that there's nothing we could do um, to achieve salvation. But once we do, it's like the, um, oh, the Ephesians 2 verse 10 that Cole talked about last week. We, we know that by grace you have been saved through faith that is not of yourself so that no one may boast. And then ch verse 10 says that we were created for his workmanship to do the good works that he set for us ahead of time. I, that's a terrible paraphrase, but um, so it, it is hard and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I, I want to talk about a story that I heard because this this took me a long time to figure out. It really did. I, I don't have a problem confessing that. Because I, I was raised to believe that I had to earn God's favor. And that, that leaves you in a terrible place where really on the inside I knew that, I was, that there was no chance I could ever do that. But it made me want to look good to everybody else around me so that I could feel like well, maybe if I look good to these people, maybe I'll have a chance in God's eyes someday. And, and then I started hearing some of these stories. When I came to faith and realized that Jesus saves us, Jesus alone, um, it was hard for me because I wanted, I wanted some of the credit for my salvation. I wanted to, um, I wanted to see that I did something good that somebody else didn't, and that was the difference between me and an unbeliever. And it's this, it's a, it sounds terrible even to say it now, and I realize they're recording this too. But, <laughs> um, yeah, but it's true, that's what I dealt with. And then I started hearing stories like, um, 
a lifeguard story. Maybe, maybe some of you have heard this. I wish I could remember where I heard it, but heard a story about, um, it, and the idea is evangelical, but the idea is you as a sinner are like someone drowning in a pond. And Jesus comes along and throws the life preserver out there next to you. And all you have to do is swim over to that life preserver and you'll be saved. And that sounds great, and that's a great opportunity for somebody, but I think a biblical view of the same story would be that you are dead, floating face down in the water. Jesus jumps in the water, takes you out, gives you new life, and drowns in your place. That's what the gospel is. The, the true gospel is not that Jesus needs a little bit of help from you so that he can save you. Um, <laughs> sorry. The true gospel is that he saves you. And now, now respond. He gives you the ability to respond. He doesn't save you because you responded. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, anybody... Is that challenging to anybody? I'm happy to talk about it, but I will argue until the sun goes down. If, if, so if we take you on, it's going to be a it's long time. It's going to be a long time, yeah. yeah. But I am passionate about this very much. But Well, let's, yeah. Well, I think that, that points up to our innate, 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 innate first pride, where we, we have this sort of like... It's a pride issue. Pride thing, yeah. And especially the United States where, you know, the, the uh, frontier people came out and worked and all this to make stuff happen. Yeah. And that's sort of an inbred in our history and I think mm. maybe in our family DNA. And yeah. No, that's a great segue so it's even. Exactly, it's, it's like a mindset. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. And I don't know quite how this fits, but this morning as I was leaving, um, my sister said, gosh, I'm missing my 10 things, 10 most important things from the New York Times or oh. somewhere. And, and I went, I just, it was like, that's what she wants to read every day, is mm -hmm. those, and that's what's important. And it was, it was like, no, it's, Christ is where our hope is. Christ yeah. is where, and I just, I don't know, does that even fit? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's finding another way for happiness and putting your hope in something other than Jesus. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it definitely fits. And then I think that it's worth, I, I, I didn't used to think that you could question anything. I thought there were expectations that you had to believe and if you didn't just automatically believe them, you, that was just something you needed to work on yourself. You shouldn't ask the questions. But I've learned, it was actually Pastor Tim one time in this classroom that said, God is not afraid of your questions. Like you, you can, I realize when I read the Psalms that David, he even gets mad at God sometimes. Like he, and, and then I thought, why? Why wouldn't we voice these questions or something? Because God knows you have them anyway. So why not? So I think it's okay if we just honestly look at why is the gospel hard to believe? Because it, I think we should just face these things head on. It's not going to change the gospel. So I have, can, can anybody think of any reasons why the gospel is hard to believe? Lance, I think, touched on a little bit of, I, of that. I, I think one, we did Mm -hmm. it, but it's the other side of it that we need to pay attention to also. <clears throat> and that is coming to faith like, like a child. Mm -hmm. You know, and, it, and for a child, I think it, it's something that could be simple. You know, I believe, I have a faith in, I believe, and I accept. Yeah. Without bringing all the baggage of the wrong that comes along with adulthood and so on. And so yeah. On. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Jesus even says something about that, doesn't he? Unless you become like one of these children. Yeah. I think it's hard to believe because it's just so incredibly sweet. Mm -hmm. And 
for especially for someone who was raised in a work-based society, but also for people, just people that don't know God, but they hear judgment stories, you know? Yeah. God is like cracking a whip at you. You better behave, you better do this, 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 and this. Yeah. And so then you hear this incredible story of, yeah. no, he loves you. Yeah. He actually loves you, and you didn't do anything to deserve it. It's just <laughs> incredibly hard to believe yeah. that it's that. Because we're told with everything else in the world, if it sounds too good to be true, then it is, right? And that's pretty good advice, but not with the gospel. Like it's, yeah, it's like people it, will say from our old community. Yeah. That's too easy. Yeah, it's too out. easy. That's too easy. But we're all stuck in that works thing. Sure, I, I agree. Even though we know that we're supposed to do something, but we don't know what that is. Right. Yeah. And the thinking, you yeah. Know? And so, I think that brings a valid point: is that we're all the same. Yeah. You know, um, we all suffer the same. Stuff. We all are broken. We all yeah. are fallen. Yeah. We all struggle with some of these same things to different degrees, for <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. That one of the things that I that I did have down was that it opposes the way everything else in the world works. If if you're in school and you want to get good grades, you work harder. If you're at work and you want a promotion and you want to make more money, you work harder. You're, you're rewarded for your behavior. What you bring into it is what you get out of it. That's true with everything in our world except for the gospel. And we, that's because the gospel is not of our world. It's outside of us. And we need to not compare it in the same way like I don't know if I can trust the gospel because of all these other things that work this way no the gospel is it's not from this world and so we, we need to accept it which even makes it all the better news it's, it's um, I have something to say yeah yeah for 50 years I rejected Jesus I wasn't interested um, I really believe that your heart has to be changed because it wasn't until Something happened in my life that I finally believed, and, and my heart, my heart had to be changed. I couldn't, I would not accept him up until I went to a passion play, and the Christ threw the, the cross down on the floor, and it just hit me. It, just, mm -hmm. it sounded like it was something true. Yeah. And, but yeah, I mean, you can't just wish somebody would be changed and try to talk to yeah. you about the gospel all the time. It will happen. Absolutely. If, if, their, if their mind is made up, this is stupid. It's not going to change until their heart changes. I totally agree, and I was going to talk about this later, but that, I mean, who, who in this room has family that's not, that doesn't know Jesus? Like, it, pretty much everybody. That, so, isn't it amazing that the truth is that it's through the work of Jesus and not through our family members' work that they will be saved? It, because... What Pam is saying is true, that Jesus has to change their hearts. Mm -hmm. They have to have new hearts. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus is an example. He was a godly man. He mm -hmm. was uh, a Pharisee. I believe he come to faith later. Uh, but before he had, he comes to Jesus saying, he had all the mental knowledge. He knew all the facts. We know you are of God. He, he confesses that. I know you are of God because of the works that you do. And Nicodemus, he get what answer does he get from Jesus? What does he tell him? You have to be born again. You have to be born again. Yeah. Doesn't matter that you were born into this family where you were raised up as a Pharisee and did all the right things according to the law. Jesus says none of that matters. The fact that Nicodemus knew that Jesus was from God didn't matter. Nicodemus had to be born again. And I believe he was because at the end of Jesus' life, we see Nicodemus asking for the body of Jesus. Yeah. So I think he was born again. Yeah, Tom. Just based on what Pam said, you know, it's humans, you know, we, we want to be in control. Mm -hmm. and, and so with that, there's an accountability piece. And then having to relinquish control and then giving that power 
to Jesus. To, it's, like, it's like, you know, just listening to music today, I mean, brings tears to my eyes because I feel, wow, a wretch like me, you know, this, yeah. this, this grace saves, you know, yeah. it's, it's saved me. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's the, I think, when I think of loved ones who haven't come to Christ, you want so bad for them just to, to let go of that Christ. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because when they do, it's it's just it's going to be life changing. Yeah. And, and then it, your heart goes up because you fear that if they don't, if some you know if they don't come to Christ soon, yeah, that they're going to be lost. And, and that, you can't do it for them. And that's exactly you can't. Yeah. You, so you can't do the work for them either. Yeah. It's supposed to be all about God. You yeah. can't. You have a family member that's not there. Yeah. You can't do it for them. Your works can't do it right. for them either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but but Jesus can. Yeah. That, that's the thing I've said a lot of times to people you've probably heard me say it if I thought there was something I could say or something that my daughter could do to gain salvation um, I would never leave her front porch like I would, I would constantly be there until she called the cops I would be there trying to explain to her all of the facts of the gospel but just like Pam said until her heart is changed it doesn't matter. I, I believe people hear the gospel with an unchanged heart. I, I believe this happened to me. That I, I believe that when my heart was changed, the spirit brought to remembrance years of things that I had heard in my life but just didn't understand. So I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't attempt to talk to our loved ones because I think that when you do, uh, even to an unchanged heart, I think that when their hearts are changed, the Spirit will use the things that have been said to those people uh, to bring them to the knowledge of Christ. So, The one thing we didn't talk about is just the, just the nuts and bolts of it. To believe that a sacrifice made by someone 2,000 years ago can wash away my past, present, and future sin, how do you make sense of that? Like, how do you... The, the, temple, the temple used to run red with the blood of sacrifices that were daily, weekly, monthly, yearly sacrifices. And, and now we learn that the blood of Jesus washes it he made hebrews says that he sacrificed once for all one sacrifice for all so just because the facts of it are hard to believe doesn't make it untrue again we're we're comparing it god gave us those those examples of the law and and the sacrificial system to point us to this great need for a savior and and then he provided that one sacrifice that, that covered all sin. So, did you have something, Paul? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I, okay. it's an issue of capacity, mm -hmm. you know, that Jesus had. And then, too, you, know, you might ask, well, if, if there's nothing I can do to, to convince somebody else, um, then the question probably arises, well, then why pray? Sure. And so, you know, I would probably say something about that. Yeah, yeah. How does that, how yeah. does that work? Yeah, I, yes, thank you for bringing that up because I definitely don't want it to sound like that. What I, mean by, um, what I mean by I would be on my daughter's front porch all the time uh, is I know that there's nothing I can say to her to make a difference. But to Christ alone, because of prayer that we have to him, that's, that's what we have. I was, I was about to say that's all we have. But that's everything. If there's nothing that can be done from our end, if that algebra is true, if it has nothing to do with us, prayer is the best way anyway. We need to go to Jesus. Um, I, again, I was gonna, I, I'm just going to go with the flow here, but I was going to bring this up later, but convincing someone of the facts of the gospel is not going to change anyone's heart. It, it just isn't. And you're not going to be the one to convince them either. No, no, and I, yeah, I'm sh there are people who could, I'm sure, do a much better presentation than me, but it's mm -hmm. not about that. Um, it, it's about the work that the Holy Spirit does mm -hmm. in their hearts. And so I think 
Peter says to Jesus, when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? This is really what it comes down to. Who do people say that I am? And they say, John the Baptist, Elijah, a prophet. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? When Peter says, does anybody remember what Peter says? And then what does Jesus' response to that? Was it your decision? It was the Holy Spirit that put it in his heart. Yes, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. It, that's who we need to go to. If you want to reach your lost loved ones, go to God. He will reach them. You know, that, I, that's, that's where I've um, found peace, anyway, is trusting that through Christ alone is where they're going to be saved anyway. So. Picture Christ in the one-on-one -on -one relationship. Like Sam said, sometimes it takes us trying all these ways to try to get somewhere to hit rock bottom before we come to him. So it's a relationship between one-on-one -on -one with him. With him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about knowing Jesus. Yeah, I agree. So what happens if we get it wrong? What happens if we, if we don't understand the gospel, the true gospel, then I think it gives us two problems. I, I'm talking about two practical problems. It gives us one huge problem, but there are two problems. It, it prevents us from having a true picture of God. If, if the Bible is clear, and I mean that like since the Bible is clear, that we cannot earn our salvation. If we believe a gospel where God sent his son to give us an opportunity to earn our salvation, then that's, that's not good news at all because zero people would make it if that was the case. So that it gives us, it gives us an unclear picture of God's love, I think. If we really need to understand the gospel, the true gospel, to understand, like Vaughn was saying, that God isn't just this angry taskmaster up there with his arms crossed, ready to punish you for everything you do wrong. No, he sent his son to die in your place to pay for your sins because of his love for you. And then we also get the wrong picture of ourselves when we get the gospel wrong. We, when we think that we can play a part in our salvation like I used to, we either believe that we've done too much to ever have a chance, so why try? Or we look around and we see people that are worse off than us and we start to feel pretty good about ourselves because at least I'm not as bad as that person. Um, and then that eventually gets you to a place where you say, maybe I don't need a savior. I, I'm doing okay. So what... What do we do when we struggle with this? Sorry, do you have your, oh no, it's okay. I'm sorry. I thought you had your hand raised, that's all right. I think the answer is to rehearse the gospel. We, we do it here at New Life every week, but even that's not enough. It, the gospel is something that we need to rehearse to ourselves every day. And understanding the true gospel will help us to not just take it for granted. And, and end up with some of the um, easy believism or free grace ideas that are, you can just invite Jesus into your heart and live however you want. That's, that's not the true gospel either. Um, Tim preached about it this morning. There, there is a response. There, there is a response to it, but it's, yeah. So I do, I have a video, bear with me for a minute. Has anybody seen the video from Alistair Begg? I know some of you have. Uh, the man on the middle cross said I could come. Have you seen that? Well, we're going to watch it again because it turns out Alistair Begg is better at presenting the gospel than I am. <laughs> I need the, uh, the accent. Okay, let's see if this will... It's only about four minutes, so I think. Uh, yeah. 
without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very... I'm sorry. Hang on. Turn up the volume. I'm trying. Oh, quickly. Revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. That's all I've got. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believe, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because <laughs> he. And think about the thief on the cross. I went on a mess. I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you were, you were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You've never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You never, you didn't know a thing about church membership, and and yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? Well, because I, I don't know. Well, you know where you. But, did, <laughs> Excuse me, let me get my supervisor. Then go get my supervisor. Okay, so, so just a few questions for you. First of all, are you are you are you are you clear on the doctrine of justification? <laughs> you guys, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about? Let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy just and eventually in frustration he says, "On what basis are you?" And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. Now, now that's the, that is the only answer. That is the only answer. And if I don't preach the gospel to myself all day and every day, then I will find myself beginning to trust myself, trust my experience, which is part of my fallenness as a man. If I take my eyes off the cross, I can then give only lip service to its efficacy while at the same time living as if my salvation depends upon me. And as soon as you go there, it will lead you either to abject despair or a horrible kind of arrogance. And it is only the cross of Christ that deals both with the dreadful depths of despair and the pretentious arrogance of the pride of man that says, you know, I can figure this out and I'm doing wonderfully well. No, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God that just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's why Luther said, most of your mercy might is outside of you. In this sense, that we know that we're not saved by good works. We're not saved as a result of our professions. But we're saved as a result of what Christ has achieved. Well, yes. yeah. 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 Verse 1, uh, Sorry. I know we'd probably rather listen to him the rest of the day. But, um, I wish I had that accent. But it's, uh, no. Oh. Uh, no. Let's turn that off. <laughs> okay. Any thoughts or questions just from that video? Has everybody seen that? Is that the first time for anybody to see that? Yeah. Hmm. I've probably seen that video 50 times. Yeah. yeah. It's truly a mystery. It is a mystery. Why did I, you know, why did I say no all those years? Yeah. For some reason, I was searching. Something, something hit me, and it was Christ dropping this cross on the ground that just hit my heart. Yeah. And what? Why did it take so long? I right. Don't know. God's timing is perfect. Yeah. I will say that. Um, 
But for me, I found some... I, oh, I, I shouldn't say... That's probably not fair to say. I feel like I, feel like I appreciate it more than I would have as a child. I don't know if that's true because I haven't experienced it as a child, but um, man, now knowing, even, even worse than just living uh, what you might say is just a sinful life. Of, I, I lived a somewhat, I mean on man's eyes scale, a somewhat moral life on the outside. Um, but realizing that there's a song that says um, spending years in vanity and pride. <laughs> Caring not my Lord was crucified. Um, and to know that even though I did that, that was forgiven too by, by, the, by the Savior that I didn't care if he was crucified. And even though I had done that, so no matter what your life has looked like, whether it's looked pretty good or it's looked terrible, if we compare it to the holiness of God, it's all terrible. All of it. Uh, Paul talks about that too. Uh, but it, it's, it is amazing that the same gospel applies to everyone who believes. So it, it is good. Probably wouldn't have it, have the opposite. Yeah. That because I invited the Lord into my life as a child, that helped me yeah. survive some of the other things that I went yeah. through and can say only because of him. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. You know, I, I shouldn't even try to make sense of it. No, you know, I, I really shouldn't. I shouldn't try to make sense of. I don't think one, there, every single changed heart is a miracle. Yes. And so there's not a sliding scale of whose conversion is the best or anything like that. Yeah, it does. It does. And Jesus can do that for each one of us when, when and where he needs to. And it's amazing. And you said God's timing is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great because point. it makes us think that God is stuck in our same time frame. Mm -hmm. But to Him, it's a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, so we yeah we need to forget about that. Forget yeah, about timing. Yeah, things. yeah. I'm trying to remember. Maybe somebody can help me out with that verse that where it talks, where Paul talks about God not being slowful, as we would think of right. slowness, but. But he's, he's just doing it. Jerry, you look uh, like you've got it. See, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord yeah. is not... Uh, he is... The Lord is not... not in other words, it says he's not taking his time, as right. we would count a person right. taking his time, but... but but desires your repentance and your Yeah, that all would come to repentance, yeah, right? The, the longer he takes, mm -hmm. the more opportunity there is for people. It's, yeah, it's great. Okay, so let's... I, I jumped around, so I've lost my place. So what's the next thing on the... We talked about why is it hard to believe... Now let's talk about why we can believe it. Any thoughts on that? If I just ask that, why, why should we believe that the gospel's true? Why should we believe? Yeah. I know who I was before. And yeah. I know the change that happened. Yeah. So it's your personal, your personal experience to proves it to be true to you. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. When I came to believe... Um, I just felt this overwhelming joy and love and peace in my heart and, and it hasn't changed. It's, it's a constant and mm -hmm. grows and that wasn't there before I didn't 
Yeah. You know, and so it's it's definitely something that shows Jesus' sovereignty. Yeah, that's great. Especially for those of us who came to believe, came to faith as an adult. Mm. And for me, July 14th, 1971. Nice. Yeah. It's an important day. But I had to have, for me, and a lot of others, had to have a real joke. I mean, my my, my, uh, legs were under me. It just cut me off. And I had nothing else I was even looking at suicide. Mm. I was that desperate. Yeah. But that's what it took. Yeah. Not everybody needs that. So no. It's like they almost have to die, or nearly, like almost at their last breath, like mm -hmm. on their deathbed. Mm -hmm. So the timing is irrelevant. Yeah. Now, yeah, it's good. Huh. I just think of the children's you know, song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, for the Bible tells me. Yeah. That's why. That's what that. he is too. A great <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because of sola scriptura, like Tim taught, because the Bible says it's true. That's how we can know that it's true. Yeah. Once I finally, my heart finally believed that it was true, that Christ died for us, I wanted to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I read it before and it never made sense, but once I, right. I all of a sudden it did. Right. And, and just lots of things. I wanted to study apologetics so I could explain to other people why I believe. Yeah. I mean, those things that weren't there before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get different desires. We get with a new heart, you get new ears and new eyes that can hear, that can see. It's yeah, see things in a different way. I had the same experience. The Bible was a totally different book. The the hymns that I would sing at church were totally different. I I sang the gospel for forty years, having no idea what it meant that I was singing the gospel. And then let's take some time and just look at, because I mentioned something earlier about just believing that a sacrifice made by someone 20,000 years or 2,000 years ago, um, having an effect on my life and my sin is, is kind of hard to believe just on the facts of it. But I think it's important that, we, that it wasn't just a sacrifice made by someone. It was... It was Jesus. It, we need to see that he's different. We need, it's, so I think we, I think we need to look both at the work of Jesus and at the person of Jesus. I think those, um, that's how I took it apart here a little bit. So what do you think about when I say the work of Jesus? What's, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Cross. Cross, yeah. 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 Miracles. 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 Okay. What did you say, Dale? Uh, perfect life. Living a per his life. Yeah. Yep. Sinless. Yeah. Sinless life. And as uh, <clears throat> Pastor Tim was talking about, he says uh, the ascension of Christ. Without the ascension, yep. there is no salvation. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What about the birth of Jesus? Do you ever think about the birth of Jesus as being the work of Christ? It's, it's uh, yeah. It, I think, I think that the Philippians two uh, discussion of Jesus explaining his willingness to leave glory to come, I, to come and do the work to go to the cross. I, I think that willingness to leave glory and come to earth is something that I, maybe I feel like that, like Tim does about the ascension. I feel like it needs more attention. I feel like that it explains why the sacrifice works, why uh, it's that God came and made the sacrifice for us, that it's, it wasn't just a bull or a goat or a lamb. It, it wasn't just blood. It was the blood of Jesus. Yeah. It's different. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, he, yeah. he lived a perfect life. And, yeah. And he was sinless. Yeah. And his blood was made pure. Yeah. Pure. It was God's blood. It was. God's. It was God's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fully human, yeah. fully God. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
and we don't have time to get into that. But, uh, <laughs> plus, you might want a different teacher if we're getting into that. But, uh, no. But, well, like, willingness to leave glory, yeah. knowing it's not going to be pleasant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, like what he had to do. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't, in a, in a, instead of a sacrifice for every sin that I do, each time I sin, I have to sacrifice. Right. Yeah. We have one sacrifice for all of this. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah. Purchased by the blood of Jesus. It's, yeah. So the birth of Jesus also fulfilled prophecy. The work of Jesus came to fulfill prophecy all the way back to Genesis. He was the promised crusher of the serpent's head. Um, he, the virgin birth was a fulfillment of prophecy plus it made it to where he didn't have blood that was tainted by Adam. He, right. he was, uh, this was important. This is, uh, this is why the gospel works. Um, and if he hadn't been born, there would be no blood. Yeah. Yeah, had to be human, had to be God. And yeah, it's, it's awesome. I used to think of Jesus as not really human, superhuman, which I know, I know, just bear with me. But I used to think things like the crucifixion wouldn't have even hurt him. He could have just made it not hurt or things like that. But man, when you read the scriptures, the agony that he is in <coughs> from the beating, he felt that. The knowing, knowing that it was going to happen proceeded with it too. How many of us could do if you know that I think that's why God's merciful and doesn't give us a glimpse too far into the future because how how would we stay faithful if we knew like he did and yeah and the agony in the garden praying that the cup if there was any other way could be taken from I think that's real I don't think that's some I think we should I think we should think about that stuff because it's is this is part of what makes the gospel work is the work and the person of Jesus. I think one thing we didn't say yet, is, which is pretty important, is the resurrection. Yeah. He yeah. says it, it, yeah. he's going to lay down his life and then he'll take it up again. Yeah. It's the work of Jesus. He will. And he didn't need our help for that. No. He didn't. Yeah. Yeah. That movie, Passion of the Christ, is really what I have to watch out there. It is. Wow. Yeah. It's. I, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of a visual learner too, and that was, uh, I've never been able to watch that movie again after I watched it the first it's time. Hard. It's hard to watch. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, the birth fulfills uh, prophecy, his life, um, not to be mistaken for, in, in a false gospel, people will tell you that Jesus came to live the perfect life to set the example for you of how to suffer for your salvation. You need to live a perfect life and you need to suffer in your death and then you will receive God's mercy. I, I don't know where you come up with that. Where, where you come up with that is because as soon as you take one step away from Christ alone, yeah. everything is on the table. Yeah. As soon as you take one step away from scripture alone, everything is on the table. If, if we don't take everything back to scripture to prove it true, then me and Dale can have two different experiences and who's to decide whether my experience is true or his is true, if they're different. You know, we, we have to go back to scripture. And that, it has led people so far astray if you get away from scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, for the glory of God alone. These are foundational things that um, just all kinds of heresies come out if you get away from these. Um, the death of Jesus, so we talked about the cross. At the heart of the true gospel is the purpose for the cross, is the purpose for the death of Jesus, and it's called substitutionary atonement. If you don't believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin on the cross, then you don't believe the true gospel. That, that is what the Bible tells us happened there. 
Uh, the wrath of God was satisfied. Um, and yeah, and it was, the death was real and he was buried and, uh, and that death, we'll, we'll read about later, was to ransom us. And that's what the Bible tells us, that that is what he came to do. It was not to set an example. Um, it, it was not uh, anything other than that. And what substitutionary atonement also means is that when he took our sin, we, we talked about this, uh, Jesus equals salvation. Jesus traded, straight across, traded me his righteousness for my sin. Like it, it is in this world the worst trade of all time. Like you, if the gospel's not from another world, it doesn't make sense. But Jesus didn't come and die on the cross to give you a clean slate, to, to wipe your slate clean, and when you believe you don't have any of those past sins anymore, and now you're on your own to earn it from there. Because day one, you've lost again. Zero people make it if that's what the gospel is. So it, it's important that we believe that the gospel says that when, when Jesus forgives our sin, he gives us his righteousness. And so that on judgment day, when God sees you, he sees Jesus. Yes. And if, if he doesn't, if, if God sees me, I remember my dad saying this one time before I was a believer. I didn't really know what he was talking about. But he said, uh, if, if I stand before God and he sees me, my dad's name is Dwayne. He said, if he sees Dwayne, then I have no chance. But he's not going to. He's going to see his son. And I was like, what's he talking about? That's the craziest thing I ever heard. But uh, yeah, later I was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what the Bible says. And so that was one of those things that the Spirit brought to remembrance once I, my heart was changed. But, um, and then the cross, Paul emphasizes on this. It, he... He says in 1 Corinthians 2, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's, that's Paul's case for sola Christus. Solus Christus. It's, it's the, the cross of Christ is enough. It's, it's what the thief on the cross experience, you know? I mean, how many of us think that we're, we're doing, we're earning something by being in this class right now or by coming to church today or by going to Bible studies or by, I mean, those are great things to do. Those are, but if you're not doing them to learn more about Jesus, if you're just doing them to add to your resume, to that I, I lived a good life, um, that it's not part of salvation because the thief on the cross wouldn't have had a chance. That's right. So it, it's just, uh, I, I, I want to be clear. I'm not saying stop doing all those things. They are, they are great things to be a part of, but the point of them should be to learn more about Jesus who did the work to save you. They're a result of. Yeah, they're a result of. Yeah, it can even be in the obedience category, I think, that it's, it's just wanting to learn. I, I almost don't even look at it as obedience. It's, it's a desire to learn more about him. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Another place uh, in Galatians, Paul talks about this too, the cross of Christ. And we talked about the Galatian church a little bit. Uh, just I'll just say it again in case we didn't. But the Galatians had come to faith in Jesus through Paul's preaching and, and others, and, and then the Judaizers came in, and they were saying, it's great that you've come to faith in Jesus, but you also have to still live by the laws of Moses. There needs to be circumcision, the eating, the dietary restrictions, all these things, and they were giving into it. And I remember being so angry at the Judaizers, and then I remembered, Paul's not writing this letter to the Judaizers. He's writing his letter to the people who had given in to this <coughs> false teaching. And so I, it's, um, 
it made me think about like I, I need to look at where I'm maybe giving instead of just being mad about all these false teachings, are there any in my life that I'm giving into? <coughs> Uh, but Paul writes in, in his letter in chapter 6, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all these other things that you're trying to do, that you're thinking you need to do, he's saying, I, I boast in none of those. Nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ. And I think that's where we need to be. And then Dale brought up the resurrection, of course. We are serving a living God, um, which is exclusive to Christianity as far as I know. Um, it's yeah Dale, Dale said it already that he had the power to give his life which he did for us and he had the power to take it back up and then the ascension as Lee brought up um, what are, we have talked about and fairly recently what are the two things that the ascension does for us does anybody have one it's just the right hand side of the, the, the right hand of God the Father yep. and is our intercessor yeah. He's interceding for us. What else? Allows the Holy Spirit to come and be our comforter. Exactly. Yep. 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 That's great. So now let's look at the person of Jesus. So I think I think it's important, and I, I would I wouldn't argue with you as long if you argued with me about this one, but I would say that Jesus is not who he is because of the work that he did. I would say that Jesus did the work that he did because of who he is. I think that's a distinction that we need to make, that, that Jesus didn't somehow earn something from us by doing the work that he did. He, he was the creator of all things. I mean, <laughs> creator, sustainer. Um, he didn't have to do anything to, to earn that from us, but he was willing to do it. Another point, or another, yeah, point that I would go to to prove that is, uh, you remember Simeon? And when Jesus was a baby, probably about 40 days old, coming to be presented at the temple uh, in Luke 2, I think. And Jesus, Simeon holds Jesus and says, that I've seen your salvation. Like he recognized, this was before he had healed anyone, walked on water, even before he was... Yeah, even before he was uh, amazing the teachers in the temple at 12 years old. This, this is a 40-day-old baby, and Simeon, through the Holy Spirit, recognizes him as God's salvation. And I, I, it's just, it, it's kind of mind-blowing to me. And Simeon doesn't say, on the, on the idea of Christ alone, Simeon doesn't say, Lord, you can let your servant go in peace uh, because now I recognize that I have a chance to earn salvation. He recognizes Jesus as his salvation. It's, it's Christ alone for him. Remember, Simeon was promised that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. And so I, I, that's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. So we're doing okay on time here. Um, I think the reason that I'm pressing into the person of Jesus is because I think that everything comes down to knowing Jesus. I think that is, I think we could learn all of the, the creeds. I think we could learn all of the, the facts of the gospel. And I think that if it was, if, if that's what was important, then how did the thief on the cross make it? You know, I, I think that's, that's why I wanted to show that video. I, it's all about knowing Jesus. So look at some of the people that, that did know Jesus, that recognized him. Like I said, Simeon. Can you think of anybody else that 
recognized him before, you know, early on. John the Baptist. John the Baptist, yeah. Pointed him out. Said, and there's the, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And then, and then when he's going to baptize him too, he, he recognizes that, no, I, I need to be baptized by you. He recognized him for who he was. So, yeah, he was one. Um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And then there was a recognition at, uh, at the Samaritan well, the woman at the well, when Jesus presses into this idea that this is, this is where he starts to, to say these things is he says to her, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water. It, and he's, he's pressing, you see the idea, he's pressing into that, if you knew me. And I think that's, that's where I want to, I, I just, I want to know him more. I think that's the important thing. Um, and then, what was that? There's something vibrating up here. Oh well. Um, so Matthew 7 kind of brings this full circle where Jesus says that there will, and Tim read it today actually, that there will be people that come to me saying, Lord, Lord. And what does he say to them? They, they, they say, look at all these things that I've done in your name. They come with their resumes. Like we're talking about. Is that, is that this vibrating? No, I think it's in here. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's trying to call me on Facebook. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's a friend from camp, from the Johnny and Friends camp that we go to. You have a video call on Facebook too. That's what he was trying. Yeah. yeah. So. Now's not the time, sorry. Um, but anyway, what, yeah, what does, when they come with their resumes and they say, look at all these things that we've done in your name, what does Jesus say to them? Yeah, I never knew you. That, that's the thing. He's saying everything that you've done doesn't matter if you didn't know me, if, if I didn't know you. That's, we, we need to know Jesus. So. Paul uh, talks about this um, idea of resumes and people having them. And he says, if you, if you think yours is good, listen, listen to mine. Uh, so he says in Philippians, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But what does Paul say? But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And this is what I hope we all feel, is that whatever we have, whatever good that we think we're doing that we would be willing to count that as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus it's it's uh, every and I've I mean you can't get around it in a class where it's Christ alone is what we're talking about but I've heard that joke I didn't go to Sunday school but I heard the joke that in Sunday school the right answer is always Jesus but I was thinking about it and I'm like it isn't it? Isn't that right? <laughs> like, I mean, when he, when he says, um, are you lost? I'm the good shepherd. Are you hungry? <sighs> I'm the bread of life. Are you thirsty? I give you living water. Mm -hmm. Tired, weary, I give you rest. Lazarus was dead and buried, and Jesus is the resurrection. He is the solution to every problem. Every problem, it's Christ alone. And I mentioned the good shepherd, and I, I'm gonna 
press in a little bit more on this, that just because I'm passionate about it, these false gospels that go around, Jesus does not say at the good shepherd that he stands at the gate and calls for his sheep and they have to find their way to him. He says he leaves the 99 and goes and finds the one and puts that on his shoulders and carries them back to the fold. It's, uh, and thank God that he does. Mm -hmm. I always like the translation of uh, I, uh, beyond loss. I, I count it as uh, it's rubbish. Yes. And for me, you think of a loss as an emptiness, an empty garbage can. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what it was was a whole garbage can that smelled bad. And that sucks. That's yeah. What we, we bring our own debris and building on the idea of Christ alone. It's not Christ plus our, our debris. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yes, that's great. Well, one more thing, just in case you're not convinced yet that Christ is worthy alone. Um, I, I want to read. I, I just came across this late last night, actually, and I couldn't help but add it. So um, Revelation 5, John writes, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And listen to this word. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. That's a problem. And, and I began weeping loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So this is the song that everyone who puts their faith in Christ alone should be singing. And what he doesn't say is... He says he ransomed people for God. He doesn't say that he made the down payment and then you're responsible for the installments from that point on. He ransomed you. And it doesn't say he gave them a chance to become a kingdom and priest to our God. It says he made them a kingdom and priest to our God. So with that in mind, let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you that um, thank you that the one who gives us the opportunity to even approach your throne in prayer is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. And Lord, help us to believe in our hearts that Jesus alone is worthy of our trust and has accomplished salvation for those who believe in him. Lord, would you help us to 
live in the freedom of that? Would you help us to live knowing that we are not required to add to the work of Jesus to please you? That that what he has done is sufficient. That what he has done is enough to reconcile us and that he has made us a kingdom and priests to you. So we pray in his powerful name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.